Bruchem Abayim. Welcome to our home. And um, tonight on the uh, My Thought, the question I'd like to bring up on this week's My Thought is I would like to discuss the question of can you prove that God loves us? Interesting. Does God love us? The Holy Boshemta was quoted as saying that God loves a Jew even more than a woman who has been barren for many years. And then, in her later years, she gives birth to a beautiful child. Well, one could only imagine the immense love that this woman feels towards her newborn child. Now, the Holy Baal Shem Tov said that the love that God Almighty has for each and every one of us is even greater. Now, this statement, it sounds great, but the question is, can we find a source for this belief in the Torah? Can we prove this? I think the answer to my question is yes. And I believe that we can prove this statement from two of the most unlikely sources. First, a tzirua, a leper, an individual inflicted with a skin disease, and the sota, a woman accused by her husband of infidelity. Now, in the third book of the Torah in Leviticus, in the portions of both Sazria and Mitzora, they both discuss the case of the individual who has been afflicted with the spiritual disease referred to as tsaras, which we translate to mean leprosy. Our sages tell us that there are seven reasons as to why a person might be affected with the spiritual disease. They are first and foremost, lush and hara, what we call tail, tail bearing. And for the record, uh, anytime you tell someone you're speaking lush and hara, first thing they'll tell you is that it's true. That's what lush and hara is saying things about other people, though they are true. Otherwise, it's a whole different uh, sin. Then the other six are murder, false oaths, sexual improprieties, arrogance, thievery, and stinginess. Now, before we begin, let me make it clear that there is a medical plague that is called leprosy, same name. Leprosy is defined by Wikipedia as a long-term chronic infection caused by bacteria, microbacteria, leprae, and lepromotus. It's also known simply as Hansen's disease. Those who are affected with disease are sequestered together with others who share their condition. Together they all reside in a leper colony, since it is viewed as an infectious disease. They are therefore removed from contact with the public at large. Now, though the Torah refers to a disease by the same name, leprosy, the two are not identical at all. Leprosy referred to in the Torah is a disease that can only affect a Jewish person's home, his clothing, or body. It does not affect a non-Jew. In addition, it can only afflict a house owned by a Jewish individual in the land of Israel, again with certain specifications. However, leprosy of the body or clothing can affect a Jew anywhere in the world. Leprosy that infects a Jew is seen as a physical manifestation of a spiritual deficiency within that individual. Now, the primary reason for a person being infected with leprosy was to warn that individual that they had sinned grievously against man and against God. Now, we are told by the Torah that we are required to give up our lives for three cardinal sins. First, killing someone else. If someone says, kill someone or will kill you, you have to allow yourself to be killed. Serving idols and sexual improprieties such as adultery. However, sages tell us that the sin of Lush and Hara, tail-bearing, is even worse than all of these three cardinal sins mentioned together. Now, the sin of Lush and Hara is so disrupted to society that God Almighty, as a benevolent father, sought to find some way to dissuade people from speaking about each other. This spiritual defect that manifests itself on a Jewish, Jewish person's body is viewed by many as a punishment. However, you know, I see it just the, as the opposite. I believe that it is really an expression of the love and the concern of a benevolent father who cares deeply for his children to the point that he is willing and able to administer tough love. God does what is needed. He separates the addict from their addiction. 
In order for the treatment to succeed, he places the leper into solitary confinement so that they can, so to speak, detox. This is much like the treatment prescribed for any addict who is trying to overcome their addiction. Now, initially, God afflicts the gossiper's home with leprosy. When that doesn't stop the individual from his tail-bearing, then God inflicts his clothing with leprosy, again, in the hope that it will act as a wake-up call and that he will realize his error and change his ways. However, if the individual ignores both of these warnings and they still persist in speaking about others, then, only then, God inflicts their body with leprosy. Since leprosy is a spiritual disease, they are diagnosed with leprosy by a Kohen, by a priest, not a doctor. If the diagnosis is leprosy, they are then compelled to live in solitary confinement outside the city. They, have no, they can have no contact with any human beings, even others who, are, who, who have the same disease as they have right now. Wherever they walk, and there are other people there, they must call out, Tome, Tome, defile, defile. You know, it's God's Almighty's hope that by sequestering the individual in a state of solitary confinement, bereft of any social contact with other people, that they will come to realize the damage that their tail-bearing had brought on society. The divisions that their conversations created in relationships between friends and family. However, the fact that they are sequestered, again, is not really a punishment. Rather, it is God's hope that the affliction of leprosy on the individual's body will be the impetus for them to do true tshuva in this world rather than carry such a grievous sin with them into the next world. We also see with the scenario of the Sota, uh, a woman who is accused by her husband of infidelity. He had warned her in the presence of two witnesses not to seclude herself with a certain man. She has nonetheless ignored his warning and is seen by the witnesses once again in seclusion with the same individual in question. The husband then accuses his wife before the Jewish court of infidelity. Now, based on Torah law brought in Numbers, the fourth book of the Torah, in the portion of Nusso, the court requires him to accompany his wife together with two witnesses who were designated by the Jewish court to escort the couple to the temple in Jerusalem. That was where the test would be administered. The officiating Kohen priest would give her to drink from Mei Me, 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 Me Hamaorim, from the bitter waters. The bitter waters consisted of two ingredients that were added to the water taken from the Kior. Now the Kior was a basin of water that stood in the courtyard of the temple. Whenever a Kohen performed any ritual in the temple, they would first wash both their hands and their feet. The Kohen who prepared the bitter water for the woman to drink, took dust from the temple floor in addition to a piece of parchment upon which was written in black ink God's ineffable name. Now the, parch the parchment with God's name together with the dust taken from the temple floor were then placed into the water where the name of God was then erased. Now if the woman refused to drink, the husband was required to divorce her but she can, and she cannot collect her kasuba. Now, a kasuba uh, is a Jewish marriage contract. It outlines the rights and responsibilities of the groom in relation to his bride. It also requires that the husband pay his wife an agreed upon amount of money should he divorce her or predecease her. However, she drank the mixture, even though she did sin with the other man then, the bitter waters would cause her to die a torturous death. Not, not she alone, but also the man with whom she had relations with would also suffer the same consequences, even though he didn't drink. She can only refuse to drink until the coin places the parchment into the water. Once the, God's name has been erased, she no longer has a choice. She must drink the water. If she refuses, well then they will force her to drink. Now, it is one of the 613 commandments of the Torah that one is forbidden 
to erase any one of God's holiest names. There are seven of them. One who violates this commandment is punishable with malkut, lashes. The holiest of all of God's names is called the ineffable name of God, which we just refer to with the Hebrew word Hashem, which means the name. Though we are forbidden to erase this holiest of God's names, still we witness that for the sake of Shalom Bayit, a peaceful home, God is allowing his holiest name to be erased in the bitter water. He does so in the hope that it will restore family harmony. Not only will the bitter water not affect the wife in a negative fashion if she's innocent, but quite the opposite. She will then be blessed with the birth of a beautiful baby boy as a gift from God Almighty. All of this is done in an effort to bring the embattled couple back together again to share in a loving and harmonious relationship. You know, when you examine the whole scenario, it's really very strange. Since neither the husband nor the wife were blameless. When the Torah refers to the husband, it uses the Hebrew word ish, which means man. But the term ish is repeated twice, ish, ish. Why the double term? The Torah is telling us that part of the problem in this marriage may well be attributed to the fact that the husband was too tough with his wife. Ergo, the double expression of ish, man. Well, she too shares in the culpability of, of at least stirring the pot. It's obvious that her husband is jealous of her relationship with this other man, and he had warned her in the presence of two witnesses to not seclude herself with this individual again. Then, even after being warned in the presence of two witnesses, she still continued to seclude herself with this man. It may be true that she did not have relations with this individual. Her actions were meant to be seen as an expression of her independence against her husband's demands. She has mounted an open rebellion against his authority. She's telling him that she is a person, not a slave, and she should be treated as such. Their relationship, well, is at best dubious. He doesn't trust her and he's willing to have her drink from the bitter waters which, if she is actually guilty of infidelity, will cause her to die an agonizing and painful death. He must be in attendance for the ritual so that he can witness all that she is compelled to endure. endure. Well, she can, of course, refuse to drink from the water, in which case she must accept a divorce, and again, without receiving her ksuba. This does not sound like a good recipe for a loving relationship. Marriage in Judaism is called kedushin which is related to the Hebrew word kedusha, holy or sanctified. God views marriage as a sacred bond between a husband and a wife. We read in the beginning of creation in the portion of Bereshit that God created Chava, the first woman, since God said to Adam, first man, Lo tov heyos ha'adam levado, that it is not good for a man to live alone. So rather than have the couple divorce, God offers them an option, that she may drink from the bitter water. If she is innocent of any act of infidelity, the hope is that after the husband observes all that she is forced to endure, the embarrassment of having her dress torn, her body exposed, her hair un and her hair uncovered in public for all to see, that this will hopefully evoke within him some feelings of compassion towards her, an opportunity to rekindle the love that the husband once felt towards her in the past. It will hopefully help them to start over again on better terms, especially with the birth of a beautiful newborn baby boy. There are many sins that we transgress in life, but we don't necessarily receive a notification from heaven that we should desist immediately or we will suffer the consequences. We do have a belief that the 248 positive commandments in the Torah are somehow connected to the 248 limbs of our bodies. When we sin, that action creates a deficiency in that part of our body that is connected to that transgression. You know, they tell a story about a great rabbi who was ill. He asked his student to make an appointment for him to see a specialist. He was examined by the doctor, and the doctor prescribed a certain medication. 
The student noticed that the Rebbe did not fill the prescription. He was curious as to why that was the case. And so he asked the Rebbe, if the Rebbe wasn't going to take the medicine, why did the Rebbe go to the specialist in the first place? Well, the Rebbe replied to a student that he didn't go to the doctor to receive a prescription. The reason he went was so that he could locate the source of his illness and then he would know which transgression he needed to correct. You know, we, we may not have the spiritual knowledge to connect all of the dots. For us to know when we are sick, which transgression we have committed and with which organ of our body. But there are times, there are times when it's really a no-brainer. If you are sitting in a dentist chair and the dentist has to drill in your mouth, well, it might be a good time to think about all the ways that you abuse the gift of speech. Don't waste the opportunity. Try to use the moment of pain and discomfort as an atonement for sins that you transgressed with your mouth. Sins like lush and heart. Again, why waste the opportunity? God is always sending us messages, trying to help us to correct our errant ways. We just have to open the email. Anytime we experience a problem in life, we first and foremost need to look inside ourselves and try to think, what is it that God is trying to teach me? At times, a message may be clear and, and obvious, such as in the case of the leopard or the soto. But most of the time, most of the time we have to dig deeper to find a connection. However, even if we don't connect our pain and difficulties to a specific dag, still, we should view our discomfort that we experience in life as a, a sort of wake-up call from a benevolent father. We need to do better. We need to be better. Whatever we have done today may not be good enough for tomorrow. You know, there's a saying in Hebrew, HaKol Bidei Shemaim Chutz Miyirat Shemaim, that everything is in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. I'd like to explain this concept of fear of heaven, not as our fear of God. Uh, that, to me, would be unacceptable. I mean, after all, which loving father would want to know that his children think of him in terms of fear? I do think that the word awe is much more appropriate. However, the fear that God may well possess is the exact same fear that each of us, as concerned parents, feel. We fear that our children will make the wrong decisions in their lives. We know what they should do. But many times our hands are tied and we are forced to watch helplessly as they make the wrong choices in their lives. So too God Almighty, our benevolent Father in Heaven who looks down on us with great trepidation as we many times muddle our way through our lives. However, just as we witness that God is concerned about the leper and the sota, so too do we need to know with complete certainty that there is a benevolent Father in heaven that loves us dearly. He never gives up on us. He is even willing to put his honor aside and administer tough love in the hope of directing us and keeping us on the proper path, though we may meander at times. You know, I would like to present a novel thought about the Sota that I found interesting. You see, in olden times, it was very difficult for a woman to be awarded a divorce from the Jewish court. She would have to prove that her husband was abusive. Difficulties that exist in a marriage are many times expressed in private ways that cannot easily be proven. So imagine if there was a woman who desperately wanted to escape a loveless and difficult marriage. What she might do is she might invent a scenario with a male friend who could not be intimidated by the husband to arouse her husband's jealousy. If she could make him jealous to the point that he would warn her in the presence of two witnesses about secluding herself with a certain individual, then she could find a way to obtain her divorce. If, she accused, if he accused her before the court, then she would be taken to the temple in Jerusalem. When she would be questioned by the Kohen, she would say that she refuses to drink from the bitter waters, but that she was willing to accept a divorce and relinquish her claim to the Ksuba. She would lose some money, 
but she would have gained her freedom from her oppressor. So, by examining the case of the leper and the sota, I think that we can prove without a doubt that there is a God in heaven, a benevolent Father, who loves us all dearly. So let us strive to give him true nachas as a sign of our appreciation for all the love and all the care that he blesses us with daily. And with that, let us help to help usher in the coming of Shia Sakana quickly and in our time. Again, I'd like to thank you for attending. Again, God should bless you all with happiness and health and safety, all that is good. I'm hoping that after Shavuos that we might, um, I've written numerous songs, at least 25 or more, uh, that all deal with uh, prayer and uh, psalms and uh, even a couple of English songs um, that I would like to present. But again, this is the time of the Spheris Omer where music is really, live music is not, not permitted. So hopefully sometime after Shavuos we will add that to the class after this and we'll see how that goes. If you have any suggestions or any needs of so any topic that you'd like to discuss, like to have me present, please uh, connect with me on my website and I'll be more than happy to look at it. God bless and be well. Again, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.